And we're live. Thank you for joining us. This is uh, Rebecca Martin. I am the founder and editor in chief of Cinema Femme Magazine. This is our inaugural uh, film festival. Uh, 20 films from all over the world by emerging female filmmakers. It's been exciting. We've been having some amazing panels, some great discussions, and I'm so excited to announce our last uh, block Q&A. This is block four. Uh, so our, our moderator, I'll start with her, is uh, Karen Kusama. Uh, she has done some of my favorite films, uh, Jennifer's Body, Girl Fight, Destroyer, and I'm so grateful that she can join to uh, moderate our panel. And the filmmakers, uh, I will list one by one, uh, Poppy, which is directed by Gabrielle Ortega, a clan directed by Claudia Lee, over and Under and Through, directed by Desiree Moore. Don't Burst My Bubble, uh, directed by uh, Victoria Malinjad. And uh, our final one is Withdrawals, uh, directed by Georgia Hudson. And Kelly Styler, the um, producer, is joining us. So I'm going to let Karen take it from here, and I'll see you at the end. Hi, everybody. Hi. Hi. I'm watching everybody get, get onto the screen. Um, well, welcome, and um, I hope you're really happy and proud to be on this virtual stage representing your films. Um, it's exciting, and you guys should be really um, proud of yourselves. And I got to watch all the films. I thought they were really fantastic. And I just wanted to start with a kind of general question about... Um, you know, motivations and intentions. And I, I always find that um, a, a personal way into the material is kind of the only way in. And so I'd love to hear from all of you um, about what uh, what motivated making, making your films. Um, I see Gabriella first, so I'm just gonna go in, I'll just point out in order the way I'm seeing it and um, we'll just go that way, I guess. Yes. Thank you. Um, so excited to be here. Well, for me, that question is kind of easy because my film is a doc about my dad. <laughs> um, so there's no, that it wasn't a reach. I think what was special about it was maintaining the organic way we were interacting and not have it be staged. And mm. if there was a moment where it felt self-aware to also honor that and know that that's a moment where it felt self-aware self and allowing him to sort of get comfortable with it and, and with me and behind the lens as well was really interesting. Um, so it, for me, just filming it as well, because I did it all, like it was just me and him, it was a great opportunity to introduce him to my world in a little in a little snippet of time. So that, and and, for me, that, that's something I want to do with all my films, sort of start from myself and where I find things to be extraordinary in my own life and then start from there and build it up. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. How about you, Claudia? Um, yeah, I basically came from a sort of similar personal way with my dad, funnily, because um, my dad's from Scotland and I would visit his family home in Scotland, which is where I actually shot my film. And um, we didn't go that often when I was young. And it was this like magical enchanting place that I'd never got to go very often. But my grandparents' house was this really unusual place full of like weird and wonderful things. And it wasn't till a bit later that I visited this Pictish like monolith, this stone that's like really, really old. Like it was a Pict, so, like the earliest settlers in Scotland. So to just sort of see this thing on the side of the road in like plain sight, and it still has these engravings carved into it, um, like 10 minutes from my dad's house. It just like sparked all this stuff in me. And um, after my grandparents both passed away, the whole kind of dynamic changed in terms of like how I thought about like place and how uh, you can have like an emotional connection with a place because of the people who were there and how when they go and they're gone, it can change. And that's kind of where it all began for me. And like, that's where the character sort of stemmed from. So yeah. Nice, nice. And did you shoot the film? So you shot the film at that child, at that grandparents' home? Yeah, so no one lives oh, there now. Wow. Yeah, it was wow. really 
quite a big deal for like all of my dad and his siblings because um, for them to have the house documented, which my grandpa like designed and built himself. So it's like a really deep family connection and my family are quite a lot of them are in filmmaking as well. So it has been quite a beautiful family experience in a lot of ways. So yeah, it was really Wonderful. cool. Wonderful. Um, Georgia, you are next on my screen. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> um, so I wrote and directed Withdrawals. It was actually based on a very real thing um, when a few years ago my GP put me on Lexapro, which is an, an anti-anxiety, antidepressant, and I didn't really think much about it or do much research um, and realized I was just feeling very emotionless and blank. So I just stopped taking it cold turkey, which you're not supposed to do. Um, and then in talking to several friends of mine, I learned that they had actually had very similar experiences um, with um, being on Lexapro and quitting it cold turkey as well, but all had completely different side effects. And the more I talked to people about it, the more I kind of found out that this is quite a common thing. No one talks about it um, and people should talk about it. And um, it's a, yeah, not very studied either. So I just felt like that would be a good premise for a short film. Nice. Uh, Victoria, you're next. So my movie is based on my own experience as a young girl going through street harassment for the first time in Brussels, but not only, it's also based on my friend's experience, on my family's experience, and on many testimonies of women that I interviewed all over the world. And growing up, I quickly realized that it never, it will never stop. So it starts actually very early, but even later on, it's it's still the same story all over again. And that's why I I decided to to make a movie and talk about it because I, I also think that we don't talk enough about this um, issue in our society. Did you know uh, when you were making the film that you were always going to, um, I guess I'm giving something away for those in the audience who haven't seen the film, um, but I'm just gonna throw caution to the wind and um, do, do that and just say, did you know that you were going to reveal how young the, the the female in question was at the very end, or had you had you played around with different um, different ways of revealing that earlier? So I knew I was going to keep it for the end. So the point was always to see her from behind, uh, for the audience to be a bit confused about mm -hmm. it. And then, yeah, I kind of wanted to have this twist, twist at the end and see that, I mean, Anyway, I'm not gonna say too much if uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> I don't know <laughs> if no one see, um, has seen the movie. But yeah, exactly. Yeah. So the point is, I knew that you know I was keeping that for for the end. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Fantastic, <laughs> uh, Desiree. Do you want to talk about your movie? Yeah. Hello, everyone. Um, uh, I'm the director of Over and Under and Through, and uh, the inspiration for this uh, project is. So I was just sort of thinking about the way that we look at one another, the way that um, in my own personal way of looking at other women. Um, and so of course I was reading a lot about the male gaze in that process. And so um, I was just trying to deconstruct that experience of how we establish um, our looking and then our, our thinking about how we look at other women. Mm -hmm. um, and so it really came from that and then uh, personal experiences sort of put throughout the film of um, myself and also my mom sort of borrowing some of her experiences um, to just sort of think about the way that we um, approach and, and think about and look at one another. I was curious, um, the film takes a somewhat experimental yeah. um, approach to that kind of story. Did you always know you wanted to be working within a realm that was not quite linear and narrative and in, in the more traditional sense? Yeah, definitely. I definitely approached it like that. Um, I really never considered dialogue as an important part of this piece when I was just sort of thinking about it. And so from there, I really just had to um, think about the impact that all the visuals would have and the way that they would work together. And it sort of led me on this more experimental path mm. from there. It's funny, there's a question that's come in that's actually asking about your film, particularly um, what, oh. <laughs> what, what drew you to using split screen um, for the film? 
I always want to put a lot of screens together. <laughs> this is just something that I like to do. I like the juxtaposition of things. I like, I also like just the aspect ratio changing. I like what that can or um, what, that, what that can add to the audience's experience. I think it, it can pull us out of that moment in a really interesting way and make us reevaluate the screen that we're looking at. Mm. Um, but if I had to be just sort of basic about it, I love juxtaposition. I love mm -hmm. putting two things next to each other. So. Interesting, interesting. Um, I was really struck in Claudia's film and Gabriella's film, how much the landscape seemed to the physical landscape and, and actually Victoria's film too, although it's a completely unnatural landscape. I'm curious if you guys uh, always felt like that was a draw in the story you were telling or was there ever a moment where you said, oh, I could make this anywhere, to tell this story anywhere, in other words? For me particularly, I'm from Dominican Republic and in the past seven years, I've been living in Los Angeles. So going home feels always like some sort of pilgrimage. And in that, in those moments, my father has taken up this hub, hobby of sort of internal tourism. And it's almost like I became a tourist to this country I lived in for 19 years of my life. And so I, most of the work I do now that is either set in back home or has some sort of connection to home. I feel like in a way as like me as the filmmaker and also part of the story is me trying to reconnect with that place in a different way. So definitely, and, and particularly because so much of the film is about my father's relationship to nature and how that's part of sort of healing. Um, so that, that was very special. This one in particular was I, I had been archiving footage for a while, but this trip in particular was very spontaneous and surprising because I didn't want to go. And so I think finding that beautiful place and sort of my attitude at the beginning and then kind of getting this gem was sort of, I don't know, magical in a way. So it was truly very happy that I chose to do it there. I think you're muted. Yeah, I think you're muted. <laughs> I'm still getting used to this way of having to do things. Um, I guess this is our new reality. Uh, Gabriella, there's a question for you about what camera you used um, because the, the, the question that says, the video camera displaying the date had me so nostalgic. Um, what, what kinds of cameras, or camera or cameras did you use? Well, I have a little secret to tell you all. I hope it doesn't disappoint anyone, but I should I shot it all on my phone, actually. Oh. Uh, and what I, well, because I didn't have any other resources and it was also spontaneous. But um, when I was growing up, we would use a mini, like a Sony Handicamp mini DV. And so I wanted to recreate what it would be. Instead of having home videos from my, like my dad shooting me, I wanted to sort of recreate that feeling of me shooting him. Um, but also to say that like anyone can make a film nowadays. So mm -hmm. and hopefully that's inspiring to someone that doesn't have a fancy camera and wants to mm -hmm. still shoot something. Sure. Claudia, do you want to talk a little bit about the landscape and that incredible scene when she goes up onto that hill and the wind is whipping around? Was that, did you know, did you know that the wind would always going to, would, would always be doing that or did you just get really lucky? <laughs> well, I mean, yeah, for me, the landscape was always, crucial it was always like another character that was kind of as important as Maeve the main character and I think because um, paganism and like Scottish history is so rooted within nature um, and there's a feeling you get when you go like into the highlands and up like hills like this like it's inevitably always incredibly windy and I think I've had that experience myself where I've gone up and you like lose a sense of like your grounding and you kind of get lost in the wind. Mm. And I, I had this really strong image of screaming, this like image of her screaming into the wind and not being able to hear the scream because you're like starting to become mm. one with nature. And like, that mm. was a turning point for me in terms of her transition into her pagan lineage. And it's like, she starts to become one with nature. Um, but yeah, we were lucky about the sunset. That would never, Scotland's weather is bizarre because one minute it's sunny, the next minute it's torrentially raining, it's then snowing, 
back to sunny again within about two hours. So we were kind of going on a whim, like lugging all the kit up the hill. It took like an hour or so to like climb up to the top and we waited and then eventually the sun started to appear from the clouds and I was like, okay, I've got to do it now. And it was just so beautiful. And yeah. like in that moment, the relief of being like, thank yeah. God, because it would have been awful to have to do it again. And it probably wouldn't have been the same if I hadn't had like the wind and the sun and like the kind of yeah. euphoria. Um, so yeah, it was, it was yeah, really important for me the yes. landscape. There's a question from the audience asking um, to, to, to what extent did you research cults to create this very specific world? It was less about cults for me and more about paganism. And mm. like, I think there's a misconception or like an idea that people have about what paganism is and that maybe it is a bit of a cult in some ways, but mm. it's an ancient spiritual practice and it's something that's like older than some religions in a lot of ways. Um, and I did lots of research into the Pictish pagan people who were, as I said, the kind of first settlers in Scotland and uh, kind of looked into what was amazing about them. The main thing I discovered is that they had this amazing matriarchal society mm -hmm. where like females really led the way and kind of dictated a lot um, of how the society was run. And um, I think they put a lot of emphasis into like worshipping nature and the sun and also like fertility and womanhood was really crucial and like for me as a woman as I'm sure we all feel as female filmmakers there's been a lack of emphasis in like complexity of female characters in a lot of genres but horror being one of those mm. and so I kind of thought it was a perfect way of blending an emphasis in complex female characters in horror and also paganism in a way that was authentic because it mm -hmm. was actually a, a group of people that really did think this way a long time ago mm -hmm. um, and trying to bring that back into the present and recognize how great that is and how we need mm -hmm. to do more of that mm -hmm. um, so yeah less about cults more about historic paganism yep. yeah I have a question for Georgia and Kelly, Kelly who produced withdrawals um, I'm curious to ask you guys about tone um, Georgia, you specifically, but um, how you approached the film, did you always know that it would be sort of riding a line between drama and comedy? And um, perhaps you can both speak a little bit to your producer-director relationship. Sure. Um, so as, I guess, someone who has used <laughs> humor as a coping mechanism my whole life, uh, kind of become my go-to style with anything I write. Um, and because it is such a serious subject, or it, you know, mental health in general can be quite triggering, um, I wanted to approach it through a comedic mm -hmm. lens because that is a very accessible way of approaching a tough subject. Um, our actors are all like improvisers, comedians from the New York comedy scene. So luckily we had a, a big pool mm -hmm. of comedians that we were friends with and that we knew so on set they bounced off each other and like their dynamic was just magical so they added a lot of the humor to it but uh yeah in general i just think that um anytime there's something that's like universal or relatable there's some kind of humor there um pain and, and truth and comedy mm -hmm. and, and all that and um, actually met kelly a week before our first shoot day and it was like the stars aligned because she filled in everything i couldn't do at that wow. point and just became like uh yeah my spirit animal. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So actually, we met through the Upright Citizens Brigade comedy scene. Um, so yeah, we had a, a good community to pull from, a lot of people that are experiencing mental health issues um, just by, by proxy, because um, we get on that stage to deal with it. Um, so I think from a producer standpoint, it was important for me after discussing with Georgia um, to hire a crew that was familiar with mental health issues, mm -hmm. um, just to make sure that there was a safe set. Because I know a lot of times when I first started working in TV, I, I felt like this very aggressive set feeling. It's very, mm -hmm. you know, and it, that's just not a, a good feeling. We wanted good vibes on our set. And I think that that's sort of how we manage that tone um, was to create a very safe, space and um, we even had crews share stories that added to the direction of the film um, just based on symptoms we didn't even know existed um, through everyone's separate uh, experiences. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
That's fantastic. Have all of you guys, um, I'm just curious to know how many of you made your short film with a, with a producer or did you produce your own films? Who made with a producer? <laughs> wow, okay, so Gabriella, Victoria and Desiree were kind of on their own. Um, that's rough. That's, that's a hard way to have to do it, to be honest. Um, and, um, you know, I think it's so important to find those people who you feel kind of can be thinking in the way that Kelly was thinking for Georgia, what can I do to, you know, sort of pull up the slack so that you don't feel the burden of every, every little thing, you know, it's, it's so difficult. Um, I see a really interesting question here. Um, for Victoria, um, talking about your casting process. Um, the reveal of the youthful lead's face is heartbreaking, especially compared to the men featured throughout. I thought a lot about that as I actually, as I, as I watched the film. Um, you wanna discuss casting? Yeah, <laughs> for sure. So yeah, the casting, the casting process um, took place in Brussels, but I was in London. So I mm. had the casting through self tape and I got many uh, great mm. applications for the main character. So it wasn't really that easy. And especially that they all told me they've been through uh, street harassment and they were only like 13, 14 years old. So, um, but I found Jade, the, the, main, the, main, the main actress and I just knew it was her. As soon as I watched her self tape, I, yeah. It, it was just obvious I loved her and uh, she's actually very mature for her age so it was really easy to work with her and her parents were on set also all the time on set um she was only 13 at the time so uh yeah it was my first time working with a, a young girl uh, on set especially it was my first first movie as a director so I was also a bit nervous <laughs> Uh, no, she, uh, it was she was great, and she I was, was struck great. by the the men that are portrayed in the film. Um, in that, there's a lot of um, kind of normalcy to them. Um, you know, I never felt like oh, I'm I'm watching someone who's supposed to be a villain, um, and so it, particularly the guy who who picks up the keys. Um, mm. You know, you just. This, the sense of always being looked at was really, really um, beautifully portrayed in your film. Thank you. Um, um, yeah. uh, sorry. No, no, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, I just wanted to say that um, because I realized that so many people don't really know what is street harassment and there mm -hmm. are so many kind of street harassment and sometimes even staring at someone for a long time oh, sure or having those really creepy uh looks um it's really uncomfortable and that's why in this movie i really wanted to portray different kind of street harassment mm -hmm. and um yeah <laughs> yeah, you did a really nice, disturbing <laughs> job of it. Um, Desiree, there's a really interesting question here for you um, about how uh, you storyboarded or blocked your scenes. I, I, note, I noted the, the framing in the film as very specific and precise. Um, and did you bring any visual influences to, to how you approached that, that uh, visual aesthetic? Yeah, um, I think when I first started thinking about the project, I really was interested in um, sort of a, a wider objective next to something very, like almost extremely close up, um, intimate, maybe uncomfortable. So I was really interested in those dualities. And so that did a lot for me as I went to think about every single scene and how it would play out, because I know I, I knew I wanted to have those two things. Um, I think that I am a, I'm a very much a control freak when it comes to the frame. Um, I, my background is in photography, still photography. So I did that for a really long time of just thinking about, you know, really where to put the camera. It's highly constructed, um, all of those things. Um, but yeah, I mean, once I settle on that sort of wider shot where I have my whole scene out there in, in front of my audience, I have to contemplate how the subjects are gonna move through that frame over time and make it interesting and um, maybe un 
unveil things that you hadn't seen in the first, you know, couple of seconds. Um, when it comes to influences, uh, there's a lot of things in this film. I almost can't even like source it, everything out, but um, I love Soviet filmmaking um, or Soviet films um, from the 60s, 70s era and their pace is just so slow. <laughs> and, um, but you have this payoff in the end and um, I just love that tension. Um, and so I, I tried to bring that in. Um, from a more like accessible point, um, pop culture is all over um, the, the project. So um, there's a scene ripped from <laughs> Dazed and Confused pretty much. Um, and, uh, but there's also a scene from Odd Man Out uh, that I pulled from. So um, just thinking about, you know, I was, th I was thinking about how we look at one another. And, and a lot of times we establish the way we look at women through media and through how we've been represented for so long in that way. And so it was really important for me to pull those visuals into my film and reconsider them. So, um, you know, and not just from the era that I was directly influenced, you know, the, the 80s and 90s, but um, also, you know, before that, what that was influenced by. Um, and so those, I was thinking about all those things and um, it, it sort of just, it came together at some point, you know, in the editing room, I had to eliminate things that weren't working, but um, yeah, yeah, I hope that answers the question. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. Um, love those Soviet movies myself. Yeah. <laughs> um, I want to ask all of you guys what in, you know, in making in making your films or in being in the process of being filmmakers, um, what's surprising you? What's throwing you off guard? What's interesting to you? What's kind of coming out of the blue that you hadn't expected? I'm curious to know from all of you. Gabriella. Um, in terms of things that interest me, I think generational curses and the things we inherit and the things that make us similar to our ancestors are things that are just coming to me. I, I recently found a photo of my mom around my age and we look mm. almost identical and that mm. freaked me out. But like in a, in all the best way possible, and I I'm just obsessed mm -hmm. with lineage, um, especially being away and, and and having sort of like a migratory journey where I feel very much at home in the U.S. But having a home in the island and all those in betweens, just like continuously thinking about the footprints mm -hmm. we leave behind and and how can we how can there's what's the spell in all of that? Like what what's the mm -hmm. divine? What's the thing that's out of this world about that? Um, Santa, so I'm obsessed with that. And hands, I'm really, I'm really big hands. <laughs> I, I love like visually. I think I, I'm fascinated by them. Not in a weird fetishy thing. Just like truly, I think hands are so mm -hmm. beautiful um, in the movement. With it. <laughs> nice, nice. How about you, Claudia? Did anything surprise you or sort of strike you as you were making your film? Um, yeah, kind of in a different way. Um, I think for me, um, I was kind of going into it with the expectation mm. that I could do a lot of stuff myself. So, um, I think from like, I work in the film industry as my day to day job. And obviously you see all these people together on set, everyone has a very specific job to do. And without all of those people, it's not possible to get the job done. Um, but because it was this like small scale thing and I had a really clear idea of what I wanted to do, it seemed like I could just get the key core like team members components involved and then mm -hmm. kind of wing it when it came to like mm -hmm. the art department and ADs and like all of these things, which I don't know why I suddenly thought <laughs> I could do it myself, but it was an amazing experience to learn like how powerful collaboration mm -hmm. is and we didn't have an AD in the Scotland part of the shoot and it was really hard because we we're kind of all trying to just communicate and get things done but without that person there to really lead and guide people and um because we had like probably 10 of us and it need it needs that like guidance um, but mm -hmm. when we did two days of shooting uh, for the night work which we did in Surrey which is near London um we had an amazing AD 
and Roz Howes, she's amazing. And she literally came in and the whole thing was just a totally different experience. Yeah. And there was also like art department involved and we had a few runners and um, it was just a different thing. And like, it seems so obvious, but now I look back and I'm like, I can't believe I didn't think about all of those components and core team members. And that was a surprise to me and something I know in the future is really important to like not leave things out if, they deserve the attention and people are really good at their jobs as well. And like letting people do the things that they're talented at and like letting them flourish and how it adds to the end product in the best way possible. Yeah, I, I completely agree that it, and I'm still learning it as, um, you know, somebody who's been doing this for 20 years, I'm still learning how um, necessary it is to ask for, all of those resources, you know, human and otherwise that you need and really put your faith and trust in everyone doing their best work um, yeah. and encouraging that experience, like, you know, ex encouraging that expectation, I think often means you get the best work um, from your collaborators. And so it, but, but the, the urge, particularly I think for all of us as women is to, um, imagine we can do all of it by ourselves, and um we really can't and shouldn't you know we should get used to asking for help we should get used to demanding the help you know mm. um because it's the only it's really the only way to do this job you know i don't really see it as a job you can do on your own um georgia and kelly do you want to talk about anything you didn't expect to happen when you were making this movie together yeah, uh, it's that's a very interesting question <laughs> <laughs> because on the one hand, like we're both so insanely like organized and type A that like everything went to plan, <laughs> but also on a deeper level, um, it, it was really surprising how uh, just genuine everyone was on set, like Kelly was saying, um, to have all these people come together and say, oh, I can relate to this, because in some way or another, everyone has experienced some kind of like anxiety or some, you know, depression or something. Um, or if not, someday you will. <laughs> but um, yeah, everyone was just so resilient, I think, because and of did, those experiences. So we've stayed in touch with so like, great. all of did those the cast people, stay in, did, did the cast already know each other when you started shooting? I believe they, uh, some of the, a couple of them knew each other, like through the comedy scene, but they weren't like a group of friends, uh, four friends or anything like that. Um, so it was kind of good luck that they all did just like spark mm -hmm. off each other like that. Um, nice. But yeah. Yeah, you get a little lucky with improvisers because they're so used to, you know, playing off whoever jumps in the scene. So I think that that kind of shows the friendship and bonding in there. Um, I think from a producer standpoint, um, shooting in New York City on a low budget is not easy um and a lot of stuff happens you know we've got we got kicked out of the subway three or four times you know we missed a shot in an apartment that we booked through an airbnb and had you know not such a great experience and you know one of our actresses was an hour late one morning um and we only had two hours in the morning to shoot at 5 a.m in this coffee shop so you right. know get, I think, get used to that ladies <laughs> <laughs> no and i mean it's obviously like we're addicted to that we're filmmakers but um, you know and so it was like you know it was a lot of that unexpected stuff but i agree with george i think the resilience of our crew and our cast and just you know like how like when we created a, a set that was a safe space um, and encourage our collaborator collaborators to do their best work. Um, it just changed the whole environment. And that was unexpected for me. I have not felt that before um, working in this industry. I will so say, if I can, I'm just it's surprising to me now, just rewatching it this morning, like what a time capsule it is because we shot in December and I edited it in January and then like, we finished it just before the pandemic. And that we didn't know that when we were filming it, those would be our final couple months in New York. In New York, yeah. Right. And then we all that, left New York. And that people can sit in a circle and chat and drink yeah. their tea without masks on and in an indoor space. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's really weird. Yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly. So it's, it's a different time. Victoria, how about you? Did you have any surprising experiences? And I'll fold in a question from the audience, which is, um, did you talk to the male actors about the realities of harassment? Um, and was that part of how you got such natural performances from them? Mm. So um, the first question, um, 
I realized how important it is to have a plan B on set, <laughs> especially with the weather. In Belgium, it's a bit like in Scotland or in England, like the weather changes all the time. So even if they say, yeah, it's going to be super sunny today, it's not true. So <laughs> you have to plan that. But the thing is, I was quite new anyway um, as being a director. So I, I learned a lot and I still have so many things to learn. So I think also I realized how important it is to be on the same page uh, with your crew because um, I, be, I believe as a director we have to make decisions and if one uh, crew member disagree completely with uh, what we want to say and I, I have a feeling especially as a woman sometimes it's like we are not really taken seriously all the time so and we want to be nice of course and set we want a great vibe but at the same time we have to make decisions so for me it was quite difficult to find this balance I wanted everything to go right, but at the same time, I knew what I wanted, so I had to be very clear. And yeah, it's not always easy, obviously, because everyone has different opinions. So I think, yeah, it's really important to be on the same page and work with people who really believe in your script, because that can be a problem as well. And, oh, sorry. <laughs> no, no, I agree, I agree. <laughs> and um, second question, so most of the male actors were from France in Paris and in Paris um, street harassment is very common. It can happen every two minutes. So they knew anyway. Um, I didn't really have to explain what was street harassment or those guys really knew it. they can see it like every day on a daily basis. So uh, it's uh, unfortunately the, the reality in Paris. So um, they are really happy to to portray uh, those guys and um, yeah, and I, I led them to be so. It was scripted, but I told them, look, if you if you feel like in, improving, like uh, doing some impro, do it. I just want to be as authentic as possible. Mm -hmm. So yeah, <laughs> it came across. It really did. It really did. Um, Desiree, how about you? In in making the film, what did anything? Um, did anything catch you by surprise? Um, I think when I think back to it, I'm always surprised that people just sort of let me do what I want to do. <laughs> um, I I don't know. I don't know how it even came together. Sometimes, you know. Um, it, yeah, I think asking is really important, um, which we had talked about just a minute ago. Um, not assuming that someone isn't going to assist you or doesn't want to assist you or can't, um, but that, that there might always be a sort of a way around that. Um, I also had an Airbnb situation, <laughs> which um, it turned out fine on my end, but maybe not on the other end, we'll see. Um, so yeah, I mean, I think that it's always surprising. And I think that, um, in general, I had to sort of uh, reconcile with the fact that it's not everything is always going to go to plan, and that being flexible actually just makes the whole experience um, a lot better, right? If you already know some things are not going to work out, and and you have that in mind, then when it does happen, it's sort of like okay, and we move on. Yeah. So um, yeah, I think that that's just a, a learning experience from working, right? The more that you work and and um, see your creative visions come to life, you get a sense of that. Yeah, and I think that the more you, you the more for all of us that we do do the work, the more um, I find for myself, the more present I become in the day-to-day -day decision making. And so mm -hmm. while I personally really like to have a plan every day um, when I'm shooting, I feel like the plan is there for me to understand what it is I'm departing from when everything inevitably goes to shit, which it almost <laughs> always does. It, I mean, or it often does. And so you yeah. have to be able to sort of understand what it is you you need in this really essential way and then be present with the circumstances in front of you to then kind of, I think, figure out, okay, I'm, I gotta go to plan F, not even plan B, you know? And I think that's a really, it's a great skill for all of you to keep sort of cultivating is that sense of adaptability, mm -hmm. um, so useful. Um, there's a great question from the audience, which is um, to all of you, uh, 
uh, how important do you guys feel um, film school is to you? And, and I don't actually know all of your backgrounds, so I'd be really curious to hear from all of you if you went to film school, if you want to go to film school, does it matter to you? Gabriella. Um, I think it depends what kind of what kind of person you are and sort of like your upbringing and, and what you feel in your artistry you're missing or you want to develop and you and you want to be mentored in. I didn't formally go to film school per se. I went to acting school. So it was sort of tied and I find that my training in acting um, has been immensely helpful for both my writing and my directing because it allows me to talk to actors a certain way that I would want to be talked to and also it allows me to write from character, which is something I enjoy the most. Like I love character driven films. However, I found that being on set, like I've been a PA, I've been crafty, I've been produ I've done everything. I've pleasant, unpleasant, I've done it and I just love it. And I think there is value in experience and I think film school is expensive. <laughs> um, so it's okay if you can go to film school, that's amazing. And I think it's a way, going to any sort of higher education allows you to have people paying attention to you. And I think that's so important to develop your voice. But I also know that there's a lot of politics involved as well. And you know, if you find a good group, there's so many things online, there's so many resources, books, just watching movies, I think also helps. So to me, it depends on what you are able to get like what you're able to do for yourself and your situation, but also it's, it's what you make of it, no matter what you do, it's really what you make of it. Right, right. What about, what about you, Claudia? Um, I didn't go to like a formal film school. I did a degree that was film, theater and TV, but it was more academic than practical. And I just did it because I loved the like curriculum and what I would be studying. Um, but, I'm kind of glad I didn't now go to film school. I gave thought to applying, but what's been really valuable for me in the same way, as you mentioned yourself just now, is that it's working in the film industry for me in like many different capacities has helped me to make contacts. Like for me, um, I've done my kind of formal education of film by watching cinema and talking about film with other people who love film and reading and, um, and some of the stuff I studied at uni. But I just think the most valuable thing that I've gained, aside from what you learn on set from being present and getting to like drink it all in, um, is making incredible friends who are also in the industry. And I was able to source that um, when it came to making this film and just like reach out to these people. I was in this position, I was so lucky to say, are you free in two weeks to go and do this thing? And luckily they were able to make it work. And it was just, invaluable and wouldn't have happened for me if I'd gone to film school in maybe the same way because it was really specific technical skilled people that came and got involved so um in terms of like how it can help you as a filmmaker I'm sure there's loads to be gained from it I just personally haven't had that experience um there's just lots to be gained from doing it lots of other ways and also there's people who don't work in the film industry and they work in any other job and they just spend all their free time passionately writing and making films on a mobile phone or on um, film or whatever it may be, whatever you can make work for yourself. Um, and it's just amazing to hear how different every director's background is and how everyone comes to it in a diff completely different route. And I think that really speaks to the fact you can do it any way that works for you. Yeah, yeah. Um, Georgia and Kelly, did you go to film school? Um, yes, so I love this question because I make fun of myself all the time for going to film school. <laughs> um, but I also did like film studies, which was also, like you said, Claudia, more like uh, an analyzing scenes, movies, nothing really too practical. So I will say um, everything I learned about editing, directing, producing, I learned by myself. But like any other life decision, I would say like know why you're doing it and ask yourself why you want to do it. Um, and if it's because you don't have anyone in your life who is interested in film or works in film, then yes, like you have to go find that community because those are the people that you're going to like rise up with and work with. Um, but if you just, uh, you know, like films, you know, be ready to have your brain broken because you will never be able to watch a movie again without seeing every single edit, all the continuity, et cetera. Yeah. 
Yeah. yeah. And I, um, I certainly, I went to like, um, an undergraduate liberal arts, like, you know, theater acting, you know, the whole shebang and learn my technical skills there. Um, but I grew up in a very small town in a kind of a blue collar family. So, uh, for me, it was like, I needed a little more. And so I went and I actually got um, my master's in, um, screenwriting and producing. Um, and that, that just gave me like the up and go to like get out of my small town and like go try something bigger and better. Um, but again, like, I think that, you know, filmmaking is like the best kind of sickness. It's like, it's innate in you that you're the storyteller. You, you just are like, you can't help it. So yeah, I don't think it's a necessary step, but I'm thankful for all of the kind of technical organizational, um, tools that I've learned from it. Yeah. Yeah. And connections. Yep. Sure. How about you, Victoria? Yeah. <laughs> so I've never been to um, a film school. I've been to a uh, drama school. But I don't think there's one rule for everyone. If you feel like going to film school, go. I do believe, though, that it's important to learn. So you can learn a lot on set. But now we have so many tools. So there are so many tutorials online. Um, I do think it's important to to learn constantly, like every day, even on your own, on your laptop, or uh, because there are some technical parts that even if you're not, for example, a cinematographer, it's important to know also how it works. Then you can understand better each other. So um, I wouldn't say there's one rule for everyone, but it, it's important, yeah, I think, to learn. But anyway, you can learn a lot on set also. And if you have a great story, if you believe in your story, you should definitely, I think, uh, make it. It's really interesting to hear from you guys um, that you had access to acting programs or started in drama school because I feel like that's the key relationship between a director and any of her collaborators. It's it's the 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 absolute I think foundational relationship is with actors, and a lot of times strangely in film school it's not something you learn um how to how to talk to actors what actors do how they approach their work um and so i think there's something really interesting about the idea that you might have a um, an understanding of what that relationship needs to be because you're sort of already schooled in that um that conversation it's, it that's great i think i think more people should be approaching directing from that um, from from that angle. Um, how about you, Desiree? Did you go to film school? I did not go to film school. I went to art school. <laughs> so uh, I have my master's in fine arts. Um, and uh, it, uh, the program I went to is very interdisciplinary. So um, I started out in photography and just um, moved on to, um, you know, time-based image making. Um, but I am a little biased on this question because I teach in higher education. So um, I think you should go to school. <laughs> um, but, you know, my background is not in that form at all either. So, um, yeah, so I, I mean, I think it's complicated. I think what everyone has said is, is very true. Some people are going to excel in an academic environment. And other people, it's not going to be the same thing for them. Um, I think kind of crucial to this discussion is getting on a set that isn't yours, I think is a really important uh, learning obstacle because um, when you're not in control, I think you tend to learn a bit more about how people function, what their roles are. Um, and so for me being on set and other people's work in all these different capacities helps me understand what I liked about um, being on set, what things I thought worked really well. Um, and that I could apply that to my own production. Um, so I think definitely get on set ASAP. Like if that's the thing, <laughs> if you're looking for one thing to do, that's it. And it doesn't matter yeah. what your role is, just get on there. Yep, and listen and listen and learn while you're doing that that job, right? Yes, I would never I would never assume to know your your position on a particular set, even if you've done it before, you know, a handful of times or whatever, um, because everything is different. Mm -hmm. um, you know, every, yeah, um, ship is going to be run differently. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There's a really great um, kind of general question from the audience. Um, 
that I'm going to ask of all of you. And um, I think it, it, the answers can go in every single direction. So um, how hopeful are you about the industry being more inclusive as a result of current movements? Where do you guys stand? Gabriella. Well, I can, oh, you go ahead, Gabriella. <laughs> I think as a general rule for myself, I have to be hopeful always because I am an immigrant. And the moment I become jaded, the moment I should just pack my bags and go home because it's already, you know, I, I've seen a lot in the past seven years of the, because I started out as an actor and in 2013, I was not auditioning for the things I'm, I audition now, right? Um, and I think there has been steps made. I also think there has been a lot of lip service. So what I think I want to, I, I'm hopeful because I'm hopeful about my generation, my, the people around me, my community, and the, the sort of connections I made with people like me or, or, you know, people that are willing to draw bridges. And I'm hopeful that people are longing for connection. And I'm hopeful that, you know, through this pandemic, people are sort of, I, I've seen a lot of people break open and that's exciting to me. Um, but yeah, I think all I can do is stay true to myself, ex you know, and, and do the best I can to you know, contribute to this medium and, and society and, and, and keep doing my work, you know, because I'm not going to stop whether or not the platform is there. I'm, I'm going to make it, you know, like I'm going to make my platform. I'm going to tell my stories. I'm going to keep knocking on the door. But, you know, I, I think I, I am hopeful that it, I think it, it should change and it's exciting to see the other things that are happening, but also I think there's a long way to go. Yeah, I would agree with that. Kelly, you want to jump in? Yeah, I was just saying, um, just, just reading, you know, things that are in production now. Um, I, I, I feel so hopeful um, that things are changing again. Like she, like Gabriella said, it's a lot of lip service, right? And I think it's our job as storytellers um, to not only be storytellers, but advocates. And I think, um, just doing this film now with Georgia in, in the mental health uh, role. Um, so many people have opened up to me that I've never heard before. And it's made conversations easier to have because you're breaking down that, that barrier in people. You're, you're, you're creating uncomfortable conversations that people don't want to have, but we need to have them. It's, mm -hmm. it's necessary for us to move forward. Um, so yeah, I'm very hopeful. I saw in, you know, for example, Grey's Anatomy is coming out and they're talking about how hospitals are dealing with COVID. Um, and, you know, that's a small step, but that's better than ignoring the problem mm -hmm. from a network level. Sure. How about you, Georgia? Yeah, I, I'm very hopeful too. Um, I feel like, especially after everything that's happened this year, it's just simply not sustainable anymore to not have mm -hmm. an extremely diverse world media storytelling, et cetera. So I do believe that, um, just like interesting voices have to explode and there's no reason why it should just be one way anymore. So either way, just keep doing your thing, keep telling your stories. Like you just, yeah. Hmm. I think we kind of lost you, Georgia. You're, you're frozen. Hmm. <laughs> well, oh, you're, now you're back. We oh. lost you there for a second, Georgia. That was oh, a, no. <laughs> a strange click. Um, how about you, Claudia? Um, what what are your feelings about sort of moving forward? Yeah, I mean, I think um, the fact that we're here having a conversation like this as all female filmmakers on a platform that's celebrating mm -hmm. female filmmakers and stories about women, I just don't think that was happening right. like five, maybe even five years ago. So I think that's a, a great thing that on a smaller scale, like short films are really important and they're a big stepping stone for filmmakers. So it's amazing that there's emphasis being put on um, platforms like this and what it means to women to be able to sit in a room and talk about film in, from our perspective. And then like on the flip side, I've been working on like bigger budget, like more um, like HGTV kind of stuff. And all of that has been really interesting because I've now seen on a number of projects I've done in the past, like two years that there's been a female director on basically every TV show I've worked on, um, if not multiple, um, which is amazing because yet again, like that's something that wasn't happening before. Um, mm. So I think from purely from a director's point of view, there's definitely stuff happening. And I think the conversations being had now in a big way 
And when I see a show that doesn't have a female director on its roster, I find it more surprising now because I think it's outrageous that people can get away with it anymore when there's that many talented female filmmakers out there. So, um, yeah, I think there's always work to be done and we've got a long way to go. But I actually feel amazingly positive about coming up through the industry now, um, as opposed to your experience, Karen, which I'm sure was quite different to what we are now seeing. Um, but yeah. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I think I think you're completely right that particularly in television, um, the the pressure, even even if it's just for the optics of it, um, the pressure is much greater to have some women directors on on your directors list. Um, I think feature films are a little bit slower to to really respond and um, particularly the bigger films um, and just fewer and fewer studio films are getting made generally. So um, I think that's going to take a little bit longer, but um, I agree that in the past five years, there's been so much more opportunity for women, particularly in, in television. Um, Victoria, how do you feel about all of your, your experiences and what you imagine your future to be? Oh, <laughs> okay. Um, I hope to keep the. I, I I I want to keep directing. I have so many stories I want to tell, and and I realize that it's such a such a beautiful thing to 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 say a story um, in hoping to live in a better world. So that's my goal. I really want to keep uh, telling stories, uh, hoping that we can live in a better society because I think there are so many things that we need to change. And um, I, I hope to, to direct more and yeah. And I hope as a, yeah, I hope also that, um, uh, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm talking really quickly because I think it's like, <laughs> like I'm rushing, it's nearly the end. <laughs> uh, maybe I'm like, ooh. <laughs> uh, but yeah, anyway, I, I agree with what you said, um, step where, uh, or, um, made but we still have a long way to go and i do think we need to stick together and work harder to to achieve our our goals oh yeah solidarity is key um yeah. among among women yeah. it's a huge huge component desiree do you just want to um quickly just give your your perspective on where you think the business is at this point yeah uh, i changed my mic so hopefully you can hear me right now um <laughs> i I am very hopeful, like everyone else. Um, I think that, you know, from my position being in academia, seeing um, the students come come through with their ideas and um, being very vocal and very interested in, in being shown something outside like the canon, I guess. Um, that makes me very hopeful for, for what we're about to see, I think. Uh, and I think leading by example, you know, making sure that you know, when you have when you have a production that you think about these things as you start hiring and you get input from people and, um, you know, starting with ourselves is really important and, and working out. Yeah, I, I think that's so true, Desiree. I mean, I feel like when I was trying to get films made 25 years ago, there were so few women mm -hmm. to even look to with the exception of the few women that I did look to as sort of touchstone filmmakers, whether that was, you know, Catherine Bigelow or Claire Denis or um, Martha Coolidge or Amy Heckerling. But I didn't create a world of obstacle in front of me um, because honestly, I was a little too naive to even understand how big the obstacles were. And in a funny way that really protected me from um, from all the obstacles I would end up meeting, you know, but I didn't go into it with a mindset of hopelessness. Um, I just sort of plowed ahead um, as if I belonged in that space. And I think that's so important for all of us to just feel like we can take the space and not apologize for it. Um, I wanna just point out that um, on the, on YouTube and on Facebook and on the Seed and Spark uh, YouTube page, there is a um, link to um, this festival so that anyone who's watching who hasn't seen any of these great films, they can buy a ticket and they can, um, until midnight tonight, I believe, 
Um, and um, you can check out all of these great movies and um, they're between five and 20 minutes. It doesn't take a huge amount of your time and it's really worth watching all of them. Um, I guess I kind of have to wrap it up, but um, it was such a pleasure to talk with all of you guys. Um, and I hope you guys had have had a great experience getting to get your films out there, even in this sort of weird new world that we're in. <laughs> um, and I wish you all luck. I, 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 um, I'm sure I'll be seeing you all again in some, some fashion with your films. Yes. Mm -hmm. So thank you for having, having us. <laughs> oh, well, thank you for inviting me. I really, really um, enjoyed the experience. So um, just keep making movies guys. <laughs> Yeah. We will. We will. We will. <laughs> <laughs> all right. All right. Thank you. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye. 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 Bye.